have you in the house of the Lord today. A week from uh, today will be Easter Sunday, resurrection morning. And uh, that's what we like. We, the crucifixion, the birth, the crucifixion is in, you know, all with great significance. But uh, even more so in looking at, and of course, if it hadn't have been for the crucifixion, the price wouldn't have been paid. But then to have the knowledge of knowing that there is a new life in Christ, a resurrection power of our Lord and Savior. So this is the week of preparation of that. As we come, we'll be having an observance of the Lord's Supper at the end of the service after my invitation. And uh, you'll have your cups already. I'll give you instructions as we uh, share that. Sometimes we do things a little bit different as I'm sharing with you um, and talking about the significance of that. And you know, if you're saved, uh, then you qualify. Uh, washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus, examine yourself, the Bible says. So if you have a communion cup you, and during the service, uh, you can speak to the Lord, make sure everything's right between you and him before you partake of communion. Otherwise, as the Bible says, this is why some are sickly among you and many have already died because of doing that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So it's a self-examination as you do that. We partake in fellowship in serving the Lord. We thank those who are joining with us today um, by way of Facebook and for those of you that are here. And I want to mention uh, the bulletin. Be sure to look at the announcements that are there and, and activities. We'd love to have you join us in any of those that you can. And don't forget, we have Wednesday night fireside chat. Still doing fireside chat this coming Wednesday. We'll see where it goes. Once we start, I'm looking at uh, when we end Fireside Chat of going into um, uh, the Bible study on Wednesday nights with the first book of Corinthians and uh, moving through that. What, what better book could we go through in these troublesome times of churches and things and in the world than in the book of 1 Corinthians? So we'll be looking at that, but this Wednesday will be Fireside Chat. I um, want to mention visitation at Green Lawn Funeral Home for Jackson Wise uh, from 4 to 6 this afternoon. Please remember uh, Kaylee and Gage in your prayers and that family. Um, funeral service will be tomorrow, burial at 2 p.m. Um, and also travel mercy for those traveling this week and next week. This is a high traveling area time for folks. And need I say to pray for our nation. Um, we, things that are happening that we've never seen. And all the politics aside and the stuff like that, I think our world is filled with so much evil and, and vindictiveness and hate and anger and competition and jealousy stuff. Sins that God hates, things that he hates. And we need to come back to the Lord in this. And so we need to pray for our nation. But I do believe this, and this will be the test of time. Romans eight twenty eight, one of my favorite verses. For all things work together for good to them who love the Lord, who are called according to his purpose. So no matter who you are, no matter who it is in our nation or what is going on, you know, just like what's happening with the former president, the things that's going on, this is a precedent that's never been established in our country. Some people are gleeful, other people are sad of all the different things. I think it's an atrocity. Um, for the thing, all politics aside, I just think it's, I think of what's happening and the attacks, the things that's unending and uh, cease. That is, we should have a redemptive spirit of things of, within our hearts and minds. This is what's driving our country apart. So I'm telling you today, turn away from whoever's president and turn to Jesus Christ. And be filled with the Holy Spirit. Turn away from whatever your political uh, favoring or whatever you seek. And seek that which is right. Turn to Jesus Christ. And seek Him. Because without that, we will not be healed until we do. Um, but we want to pray for our nation. Continue praying for Ukraine. And I know there's unspoken requests today. And we want to pray for those as well. So if you'll join me in prayer. And I do want to welcome you. Thank you for coming today. Dear Father, you know our hearts, and even at the very best, when we strive to do the best that we can, we still fail, 
We need your mercy and grace. We need understanding. But not only when we receive your mercy and grace, may we extend that, Father, in our lives to others around us and, and just to try to be more like Jesus in everything that we say and do. Bless and comfort uh, Kaylee and Gage, Lord, during this troublesome times of losing their first child and just be with them and their family during today. And bless us today, Father. Draw us into your presence as we come to worship you, and we'll give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we got a real treat this morning, didn't we? That was awesome. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Speaking of the blood of Jesus, we're going to sing about it, too, this morning. Uh, if you would stand with us, well, we'll give just a second. Here. We'll let everybody get in their place. Okay. All right. There you go. All right. Sing as we... <laughs> Oh, God. 
to this. This is so beautiful. <clears throat> I will not boast in anything. 
some more water. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you, choir, Deborah, Lauren. If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to open them, if you would, with me to the book of Matthew. We'll be reading chapter 9, verse 20 through verse 22. Matthew chapter 9, verse 20 through verse 22. The title of the message is, Your Faith Can Make You Whole. Listen to the words. And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood twelve years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be made whole. But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. May the Lord add the blessing and grant understanding today to our hearts of his word. You know, this woman used, uh, I think, as an example of faith because she believed that she could be healed just by touching, thank you, hon, just by touching the hem of Jesus' garment. But really, the passage of Scripture can show us, I think, a deeper understanding of faith than that to which we think to be great faith to take that. And I want to I share this with you and maybe see some different insights about how the application for our own lives and looking at this. Notice three things with me this morning. Number one, you'll notice, first of all, the very first thing we saw in verse 20 through 21. Here was a woman sick for 12 years who's seeking healing from Jesus. The other Gospels, different stories, will account the fact that she's tried everything. She's looked to others. She's went, she's done all the things that are possible for her to do this. But apparently she has heard of Jesus. She has also heard of the fact of, of his healing others. And she believes in her heart as she's looking at this to say here in the situation that maybe if she could just do that, but she does have a problem. And we'll look at that in just a moment more into the problem. But she has this issue of blood she's had for 12 years. And the problem of that, as we'll share in the next point in just a moment, will be the fact that that presents a complication. But look at this in the physical point of this situation. She continually feels exhausted physically. Emotionally, she must feel isolated, more so than anything or anyone else, because she is considered to be unclean. So that separates her from everybody else, kind of like having COVID, isn't it? Quarantined. In the Bible, the Old Testament is talking about people with leprosy that they, they had to wait outside of the city gates or the places uh, uh, because they had leprosy. And it was a contagious uh, disease that there. So they, and they had to wait until they were healed or clean before they could go in. And, 
And we've seen Jesus heal leprosy. We've seen God in the Old Testament heal leprosy. That's like Saul when he put his hand out to worship and, and engage himself because Samuel was late getting there into a sacrifice he was going to make and, and his hand turning to leprosy, you know, because God placed it there that he put his hand to handle something of holy that wasn't called of him to do so. We know there are the facts of, of recompense or there's problems that comes when we sometimes come and we go through the motions of things within our heart that we want to serve God to do these things, but then, you know, there's one little problem. It's the sin of the heart. We all got a little situation going on in our lives that just keeps us just a little bit back from what God would want us to be or what God would want us to do. So physically, here she is with this. This is her problem, this issue of blood, 12 years. Emotionally, she is isolated because she is unclean and probably ridden with guilt within her, her life. And maybe some of you might understand it. I know that I do as I look back at sometimes things in my life that, that just, you know, you might be forgiven of sin. You may come to the place where you're cleansed of sin and all the different things, but you can be ridden with guilt for your sins, even though they have been forgiven by God. That is, but that <clears throat> this is a conditional thing. Just to automatically say and then fall back, God, forgive me my sins, is that if it don't come from the heart and then you jump right back into as you're doing, as we're continually doing and, and praying, P-R-E-Y-I-N-G, upon God's mercy, God's grace, that we continue to just stretch out these days of grace and mercy to keep doing things, remember there's consequences that comes and complete healing will never truly take place until we are totally surrendered, till we are fully given. But not only is she physically, emotionally, but spiritually. She has, that, that's the thing, she's separated from everybody else, but she's separated from God. And this was the thing, probably the biggest thing, she's cut off from him because of her uncleansedness. When I am cut off from God, how can I, how can I make my way to God? I'm sure there's a lot of people who feel the same way today that might be out there in drugs and drinking or, or there's other subtle sins that's in our life that maybe just don't feel worthy of being able to come and to worship God. But that's the wonderful part about the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we come to worship God and, and to serve him through Jesus. That's why we lift that name up that draws every man nigh unto him if he's lifted up. Her seeking only to touch Jesus' garment is an effort really not to contaminate Jesus. She, she knew what was happening if she was caught with an issue of blood of touching a holy man, let alone, or anybody else would keep them themselves from coming to the temple or place or to worship or coming into the presence of God because then she would make them unclean. Sometimes we do that as friends. <clears throat> some, some people say uh, because we get caught up into and support the ungodliness of those around us to whom people we love and we will support and go and listen to and to do those things. And that, what we hear and support, you know, Jesus said, let your yea be yea and your nay, nay. And that's where we get called up into sometimes. We have to learn to stand for truth. We have to learn to come to the place of what is right. And here is this lady's coming. She knows if she touches, so she did not. She did not want to be found out, and here she is. If I can just touch the hem of his garment, and maybe that will heal me, but it won't contaminate him. My sin won't pass over to that. How many times that you get around people, I know some people says, you don't need to, I used to tell my kids, you don't need to be running around with those kids. You don't need to be with those. They're a bad influence on you. And they might say, no, I'm a bad influence on them. 
And that's probably true. They'd be in a preacher's kid and things and think you get by with this or that to do certain things because they like to pull you out in because sometimes we like to tear people down in order to put ourselves on the same level with them rather than thinking that anybody else is here and trying to reach up this place. The problem, when you tear down the rungs of a ladder, it's hard to get back up. When you lose your friends, when you lose your influence, when you lose the things within your life and come to the place that you hit rock bottom, then you realize that there's no way to get back up in the old way. You've got to find a new way. And that's what happens in your life is that you've got to say, I've got to start over. I've got to rebuild here. I've got to restructure. I've got to rethink this. But she knew the law. She knew what it was. She knew that if particularly they would declare him to be unholy. Now, Jesus is on his way to heal Jairus' son, who had come to him in the sense of, of saying that he had here, this will be taking place soon, and the word, this is where he is going. He's on a mission. And the crowd is flocking around. They've come. In fact, this, this ruler, this centurion, he is telling, he says, he had such faith. He said, if you just speak the word, you know, I know it would take place. I know this would happen because he knew he had faith there. He was expressing. But here you find with this situation and then all at once word comes to them to say that, well, don't bother the Lord anymore because your son has died. And they're all grieving. Jesus says, let's go. And when you get caught up into that, Jesus is going because, you know, Jesus wants to meet the needs within our life. Jesus wants to heal what is broken in our life. He wants to do that. And whatever, that's why he came, so that we could be made whole. Many of us limp around in life, physically or emotionally, mentally, spiritually, that we just simply, we aren't together and it seems like there's always something that keeps pulling us back from God and that's where we have to make the decisions within our life to say are you fully committed to the task before you in getting to Jesus Christ to really believe to have the faith to believe that what effort you put forth is enough The effort you put forth to say, whether you come on Easter Sunday to church or Christmas or whatever you do to say that that's going to get me in the effort I put forth. What is that going to get me? Where, where am I going to get to? Granted, you may find partial healing, but you may not find ultimate healing. And I, let me share why, because as you look at this, she's thinking she might contaminate him, and she's not willing to face him in her condition. It's not great faith, really. It's little faith. Because she was still trying to do it on her own. Do you hear that? Even though sometimes that when we come to church and we say, I surrender all, I've given, all, I've, I've given my life to him, but find it, you know, yeah, well, I know I can't save myself, so yeah, you trust Jesus as your Savior. But then living the Christian life, following Christ, where is it that he tells you to stop following him? It's not there. The thing within your life when you come, here she is trying to do it on her own because she's figuring out if I could just simply, and she's crawling on hands and knees through the crowd. Can you imagine that as they're walking, or how fast or how she would have to kind of maneuver herself? And I know she's touching a lot of people. They're bumping into her. They're, <clears throat> they're probably like, <clears throat> Some of us Baptists that gets a little bit irritated if somebody slows down in front of us or on the road or in our car and we're honking or, or in the Walmart park uh, uh, lane when we're going through to get groceries or something on the line and or maybe they're a little slow there at the restaurant or things are going on. I mean, you know how it is or other people kind of step in front of you and here this lady's crawling through. Here she's come. This is the situation in her life. What is the situation in your life? As you assess, looking at yourself, she saw it was hopeless of trying to do everything else, and maybe you're still trying to do 
other things. But notice, secondly, the complication. She knows that she has touched the hem of Jesus' garment. She has touched him. In verse 22, when she did all of that in her situation, her goal was to touch the hem. It's like the garment without touching him. As his robe was coming down like this tie, is that if I could just, if I can put my hand on the, having the faith to say it is connected to him, if I can, that that's, seems to be a great deal of faith. It's kind of a, in a sense, I admire her in one way, and as I've come to understand and to dissect this scripture, to look at it, just to pull it apart and exegesis it, to look at it, to thinking about what great faith and effort it took on her part to come and just to go through there to say, if I can just reach up there and touch the hem of that garment, I believe I'd be healed. If I could touch, she found out something happened in her when she touched it, and she begins to walk away, and as a crowd is walking away from her, and she's beginning to kind of back out of there, the complication arises. Verse 22, Jesus turned him about. In the other Gospels, Jesus said, who touched me? Her mind was that if I touch him, I'm, lava, I'm apt to make him unclean. I'm apt to render him powerless. If he becomes unclean, he can't do what he, he's going here to heal somebody else. Her knowing that, because she's heard what's taking place, her knowing that was, it might be just a little bit selfish in a way to think that if I could just, and even though we would feel sorry for her and, and pity her to look in her condition. But in the process, Jesus and the whole crowd, and of course, as you read the Gospels, the other the apostles and different ones, they're saying, look at this crowd, Lord, and you're saying, who touched me? You look, look at every, you know, all the people around here. Isn't it amazing that just that gentle, seemingly insignificant touch of just grabbing... Just the hem of his garden. Now, she didn't jerk it, you know, to jerk it off. I'm sure she just lay, just had to get her hand on it. If I can just do that to have the faith, just, just to caress, just to touch his garment, and Jesus felt it. You know, there may be something in your faith that has moved you close enough to where you could reach out and touch Jesus and to know. And when you've touched the heart of Jesus, there's still something else. In order for complete healing to take place in your life, because Jesus won't let it just go that way and say, secretly, you're just going to go off and, and to do your own thing. You kind of studied, if you came to Sunday school today, and I hope you did. If you didn't, need to. We got some good classes for you. But what you notice was the story about Joseph Arimathea and Nicodemus, who came to bury Jesus. Nicodemus, we wouldn't have known. Joseph Arimathea, we hadn't heard much about him. In the Bible, until this time, a rich, wealthy man gives his tomb to Jesus. But Nicodemus introduced in John chapter 3, way back earlier, and he's a teacher. He's a religious man. He sneaks out at night because he's afraid of his peers and what they might say to him because he's heard about Jesus. And he comes out, so he comes out by night to set up a meeting with Jesus and to talk to him in the garden there. And he's saying, good master, we know that no man. And he starts right into his speech. About, and Jesus said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Let's just get past all the little stuff. Let's just deal with the real issue here within your heart to say that what it really comes to here is you must be, if you want to go to heaven, if you want to see heaven, you must be born again. We don't see anything about Nicodemus making a conversion, anything about that. We don't hear about him until later on and all the different things in his life of what took place. But he took it all in. When Jesus gave him the analogies, he questioned with Jesus, tried to reason with Jesus, and he was trying to figure it all out. And then later, as you saw in John chapter 19, in your Sunday school Bible study today, Nicodemus comes with Joseph Arimathea. 
Here was a rich man that's given the grave. Here comes the preacher with him and the different ones who was teaching, but he didn't, you know, here he was in this religious form coming with him. And, and you see, so therefore, there is a healing that takes place in the heart of Nicodemus. When someone comes to the point of touching Jesus, there's an impact that is made in your life when Jesus touches you. When he makes an emphasis into your heart. And you will see that. It won't stay secret. It won't stay hidden. And just like with this lady coming and crawling there and touching the hem of his garment, and Jesus turns in verse 22 and he says, he says, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the Bible says the woman was made whole from that hour. Not the moment when she touched him. You see, your healing may not be complete just by the fact of coming to church. It may not take place in your life to say, oh, I believe in God, I pray, I do all these different things because, you see, she wanted to remain hidden. She believes that she's guilty of making Jesus unclean. Perhaps to her, he, that his, he knew his power was gone from him. Wouldn't it be awful? To know, to think that here all once that this, her touch drained the power of Jesus. Sin drained the power. But I want you to know, praise the Lord, sin is not more powerful than our Savior. It is not. It wasn't then and it isn't today. And so her thoughts may have been now that he would not have that power to heal Jairus' daughter. But look at the third thing today. The resolution. Jesus declares her faith has made her well. In verse 22, he turned, he said, Daughter, of good, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And that woman was healed. The woman, from that she was made whole from that hour. The Gospel of Matthew, she's not completely healed until this time. She's healed not so much by the faith which takes her, I guess, when you're looking uh, here to come and to touch the hem of the garment, but it's that faith that leads her to meet him face to face. You know, she had a little of faith enough, greater enough, and that took a lot to crawl through the crowd, try to be as discreet with her disease, her issue of blood, and being unclean, making sure nobody recognized her, and all the different things in her discretion. But it was when Jesus says, she's trying to crawl away. And then Jesus says, daughter. That's when everything gets quiet. And she has to step forward. She has to confess. She has to let everybody else know what has happened to her. And all at once, here it is. Jesus says, your faith has made you whole. You are complete now. You have physical healing. You have emotional healing. You have spiritual healing within your life. That if you just simply, in reaching out, Jesus turns to her, and it's by her confession, her repentance, when she comes to him, that you'll notice this takes place. In, in Jesus, this woman meets a holiness that cannot make her unclean and a love that will not let her go. And I think that's the wonderful part about our Savior is that you think that we can contaminate Jesus. No, sin is not more powerful than our Savior. If you get saved and you're saying, here I am, and, and, but I'm still a sinner. I still try to live for my life. So many people get to that point. They give up. They quit. You've got to stay with Jesus. You've got to listen, answer the call when Jesus calls you to confront the sin within your life, to admit, to confess whatever that sickness, that disease is within your life. Be real with Jesus. And when you are, you'll notice some real significance in your life of what that touch will do for you within your heart. Jesus is not finished with her. He wouldn't let her go until her healing is complete, physically, spiritually, and emotionally. Her faith is a type that made her whole because it caused her to crawl to Jesus and to come back and to face Jesus. I wonder if you have that kind of faith today. 
So many people leave away. I feel it when I give an invitation oftentimes. I don't know everyone's heart. In fact, I don't know anyone's heart but mine. And sometimes the Holy Spirit would just be speaking to you, you know, and there's that moment. And I know because I've sat back there. And the songs have gone. The preacher gave the invitation. Oftentimes, I didn't even know what he was saying, but I knew what I was feeling. And it was just like a thump, thump, thump. There just a knock at the door of my heart to say, I know I need to get right with God. He was calling me, and he was calling me to turn and to face him. He was calling me out. You know, the Bible says, except he call you, you can't come to him. And so when you, when you hear, when you respond to that, that's when the healing takes place in your life. No matter, you don't have to worry about, you see, she couldn't do it on her own. She couldn't get rid of this disease, this blood issue that she was having. You can't do it on your own. You can't quit smoking. You can't quit. Oh, you can try. You can try quit overeating. You can try uh, adultery. You can do all kinds, whatever it is, unfaithfulness, whatever that you have, whatever that sin is, anger, gossip, hate, whatever it is that is there on the edge within your life, any sin will separate you from God. Any sin. And that's why every day we need to stay updated with the Lord. Stay relevant with Him. Stay current. And that don't mean that you... We, we shouldn't fake it. Be honest with God. And the moment that you're honest with God, you're going to notice a big turnaround in your life. When you come because you're going to be honest with yourself. And to realize what's going on in your life and what is here, this, all this stuff that's built up in me, you're just letting go, it's just giving it over to you. It's just, go, okay, here, come and as you are. Let him see all those things because when you do, you have that kind of faith. Hers was a little faith, but it was enough when it was placed into the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, a faith. Is your faith strong enough in Jesus to make you whole? To come to him, not just once, but notice she came again. Not just to touch him, but to face him and to be touched by him. Pray with me. Father, I want to thank you and praise you today for your presence, for your word as you spoke to our hearts Help us to respond in a way that will bring the healing that you desire within each of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, would you stand with me? What are we singing, honey? Have thine own way. I will meet you up here at the altar. If you just need to come and pray, you need to speak to me. You let the Lord lead you. You come walking in faith, not to see me up here, shake my hand, but Jesus. You just come, and by faith, I'll be a part of his welcoming committee to welcome you along. Let's sing. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. If you're in the back of the church, the front, the middle, just step out and come. Make me Oh, hi, sister. Anyone else? Have thy is 
Is he having his way with you? Anyone else? Help me, I pray. Power, all power, surely is thine. Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. And all God's people said, would you be seated for a moment, please? And I will get that. Miss Joy, you come up here, and we'll get that from you later on. And I won't have you. Amy will get that for me and stuff. And she'll even get a pretty picture of you today. You know, everybody got the memo, you know, is wearing this color and thereabouts close today. I'm teasing you. Uh, this is Joy. I see, I forgot your last name. Hoover. Hoover. Like the vacuum, vacuum cleaner. Is that right? Yeah. I hope you own that company. No. Oh, shoot. <laughs> if I do, they forgot to tell me. They forgot to tell you. Joy's been visiting with us for some time, and she come forward this morning saying the Lord's leading her to join our fellowship. So if you join me in welcoming her, would you say amen and smile? And uh, your new church family. Would you like to say anything to your new church family? Yes, I would like to thank you all for making me feel so welcome here. I mean, it was wonderful. Amen. Amen. We're glad to have you. And uh, we'll get this. I'll let Amy get this and I'll have and we'll I'll take care of some other stuff. And then you all can join us here in a moment on that. Um, I'd like for you to get your communion cup. And uh, if you would, does everyone have a communion cup? Anyone don't have one? Raise your hand. Okay, uh, Ralph, can you take care of that for me, please? Hold your hand up and we'll get you one. Got that. Okay, anyone else don't have one? Hold your hand up. Yep. All right, right up here, Ralph. We'll make sure we want everyone to, to have. We're still doing the sanitary process for communion cups at the time being. Um, uh, we usually have the trays and pour the juice and things into um, but it's just for this purpose to be able to do it, and you see the wafer. So um, in, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, verse 14, Jesus is meeting with his uh, apostles at the Passover time, just about right in this time of coming. Now hold on, don't be tearing anything open yet. Uh, and uh, you'll find him meeting there with them. They just had finished supper, and they're coming to the place of uh, taking, uh, celebrating the Passover supper to which they'd done. And then he took and instituted what we called the Passover, the Lord's Supper. And he took bread, and he, uh, he you know, gave to him, broke the bread, and, and indicated to him, said, this is my body, which is broken for you. He took the cup of wine, and he poured it, and he was saying that the wine signified the blood of the New Testament that was shed for our redemption, his blood. This is the reason we partake in doing this. And I think, Joy, you have a cup back there at your pew, do you? Yeah, okay. And uh, so if you, there's a little thin layer to get your wafer off. If you need help getting that, take and peel back that little thin layer, if you will, please, and get your wafer off the top of the cup. Okay. So for the bread, and uh, this is the wafer, and Jesus took, and he blessed, and he broke the bread. So I'm going to break, and let's pray. We understand and know, dear Lord, that as you shared this in the very first Passover supper of the New Testament with the apostles, that this bread represented the brokenness of your body upon the cross that would be coming up just a week later from the time of when you were observing this thousands of years ago and you've commanded us to continue as often as we do in remembrance of you of breaking this bed that what it represents is that we have opened our hearts and received you into our hearts and thank you for being the bread of life in jesus name amen and jesus said take and eat And then with the cup, if you'll peel back the 
the layer on the cup. This cup signifies the blood of Jesus Christ, which means that's the qualifications of that is to say that you, you don't take in this bread or drink in this cup won't save you. You see, you get there and you're not completely whole. You touch the hem of the garment and crawl away and just kind of be quiet. And nobody knows, but Jesus knows. You're touching the hem as you have just taken. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you need to complete your healing by facing him and confessing and repenting your sins right now. And let his, he says, this blood cleanses us of all our sins. And that's what we trust in him for as our Savior. So as we partake of this, we know that it is the blood of Jesus that was spilt at Calvary that gives us the forgiveness of our sins. Let us drink. And in that same turn, that as they partook, they went out together. And Deborah, if you'll come, Lauren, and if you'll stand with me, please, and you'll place the cups. You can take, there'll be a garbage can set outside the door if you want to carry a cup to drop it in or whatever and uh, to have a part of that. But hadn't it been good to be in the house of the Lord today? And Joy, we just welcome you, so be sure to get around to Miss Joy if you'd like to join me and Deborah at the door so folks can shake your hand and greet you officially, okay? We'll do that. But uh, love every one of you. Don't forget Wednesday night, and then we got Sunday, Easter is coming. Bless you all. Have a blessed week. Yeah.